Today's interview is with Mike Harris. Uh, Mike served um, in the Navy for 20 years, um, and then he had an interesting experience that led into real estate. Um, he was the victim of some fraud. People bought a house in his name without him knowing, knowing it. So really interesting story how that all transpired. Thankfully, it all worked out, but it also led him to real estate and real estate investing. So uh, fascinating story today about how, how all that worked out. As always, like and subscribe on Wrestling With Real Estate, the YouTube channel. Go to the WWRE podcast and give it a five-star rating and write me a review if you think it's worthy. Um, and I'm looking to speak to as many of you as possible. If you're interested in talking about real estate and finding out more and if there's any way that I can help you whatsoever with that, I would love to, to, to help facilitate that. So there's going to be a link in the description down below or you can go to wrestlingwithrealestate.com and sign up there. We can just hop on a call and have a great conversation about real estate and hopefully I can help you in any way that I can. Um, but before that, uh, enjoy today's great interview with Mike Make a Move Harris. Hello and welcome to Wrestling with Real Estate, where we look to chalk slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multifamily real estate investor Barry Griffiths. Now, today we're joined by Mike Harris. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you, Barry? I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing fantastic. I'm very happy that uh, you're on the call today and we were able to make this happen. So I appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to jump into today's conversation. We were talking a little bit beforehand. And it's going to be, a, be an interesting one, I'm sure. Um, but before we do that, can you give us a bit of a, an idea about your background, what you've been up to and what your current focus is? Okay, so yeah, about my background, a little bit about me. I'm um, originally from the Bay Area, Oakland, California. Um, I grew up there um, till about 19 years old when I joined the Navy, uh, U.S. Navy. Uh, I served in the Navy for about 20 years. Um, after doing the Navy for 20 years, I, yeah, I got a federal, uh, a federal job with the uh, Department of Defense. I did that for about three and a half years, and then I just decided that I, was, I had enough. <laughs> so I decided to jump in uh, the real estate world full time and I've been doing that since. Uh, primarily, I focused on uh, residential real estate and sales. And now I'm transitioning my focus from just sales specific to more or less wholesaling and fixing and flipping with the intention of, you know, buying, holding. So that's that's what I'm up to right now. Very cool. Very cool. Wow. Well, first and foremost, thank you for your service, man. That was 20 years in the, in the Navy. Uh, that's a long time. You must have traveled quite a bit, I'm guessing. Yeah, 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 yeah. From all around the globe. <laughs> oh, really? Where uh, do, do, you, do you have a do you do you get to experience many of these countries? Or are you mainly on the ship uh, most of the time then? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, for the most part, we get to experience them. Uh, I mean, if it's a Liberty port, then that's all we're doing. We're, we're It's like we're on holiday and a vacation and we're just out, uh, you know, mixing it up with the, the locals and, and enjoying ourselves. Uh, it, the other times where it's a working port, you know, we it's it's the same as if we were pier side in the U.S. We, we work our traditional hours and then we go out kind of relax a little bit and then come back on the ship and get ready for the next day. So right. it's a little bit for both. Yeah. Do you have a few favorite hotspots that you went to? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Is it too hot to say? No, 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 no. I, I enjoyed uh, Australia. Uh, Bali, Indonesia was, was a really fun place to be. Australia was as well. Uh, Dubai, that's a really great place to visit. Um, the the kingdom of Bahrain I, I served I, I spent about a year there so that was a great tour um, Italy is always a great place to be um, I don't think we go there anymore but Haifa Israel used to be a fun place um, where else uh, Hong Kong Singapore uh, those the, those are just several of the great places we I was fortunate enough to travel to and enjoy. Wow, that's cool. I, I love traveling myself. So to, to hear you've been to all those cool places, I'm, I'm quite jealous. The, um, when you were 19, what made you join? What made you join the Navy, you think? Did you, did you have an urge for traveling or was it just you just wanted to, to serve or something else? Uh, well, I, you, know, pro, you know, 
I had, when I was 12, I had went, I was either 12 or 13, I know I was in middle school, and I went to a field trip to San Francisco for Fleet Week, and we got to tour a car aircraft carrier and kind of get firsthand view um, from what the Navy does. And so I had already, I had always had that in the back of my mind that that's something that I was interested in doing. And, you know, several, six, seven years later, you know, I was kind of wanting to get out of the Bay Area. And I thought that was the fastest and most efficient way to do it. So I, I, I jumped right in head first. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Well, thank you so much for your service, man. It's uh, fascinating to hear you, that you traveled all these countries. Um, I think w w when you got out, was that a different, difficult transition? Because now, you, you know, you've been traveling for 20 years, right? Is it a difficult, difficult transition to then come back onto sort of land as if I know you were on land to some extent, but to, to be permanently based in some places, was that a difficult transition for you? Uh, it wasn't as difficult for me as it is for some others, because I, I've literally been stationed only in three places. Uh, my first tour of duty was in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And then I came here to San Diego. And outside of one year in Bahrain, I've been here in San Diego the entire year. So I've, I've spent about, I've been in San Diego since 1998. So okay. it, it, was, it wasn't that difficult for me. <laughs> yeah, not a bad place to live, huh? If you to, to yeah. find your time. So, so then you said that you, you eventually got into real estate and, being, and on the agency side. What, what made you go in after real estate? What, what uh, sparked your interest in being a, a real estate agent, you think? Well, uh, I had, um, when, the, when the real estate boom in the early 2000s hit, you know, uh, I had some, some friends in the state of California and out of state, and I was just very interested in, uh, you know, the, the possibility of making money that way. And so I had some friends reach out to me and, you know, they pitched me purchasing some, uh, some rental properties out of state and not knowing much about it or not knowing anything at all. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears and I'm open to it. Uh, unfortunately, they, they, they acquired those properties without my permission in my name. So they ended up being mine. And I ended up, you know, eventually losing those uh, right around the, um, probably a year or so after I, I had, uh, they were purchased, I should say. Oh, wow. So having all that happen, I wanted to make sure that I knew as much as I could possibly, as far as the ins and outs of real estate, the transaction and, and that world. So I decided to get my license, um, which I, I didn't end up getting my license uh, until 2010. So, and I've, I've been licensed ever since. Oh, wow. Okay. So Oh, so you got your license in 2010. So the rental properties came first and then you kind of got, got your license after that. Yes, that's okay. correct. So um, and you, you're not quite in um, San Diego right now, right? You're just a little, little bit outside. Or where, where exactly are you? So that everyone knows. I'm in a city called Chula Vista, which is, you know, bordering uh, San Diego. Uh, so, you know, if, if I'm about 20 minutes from downtown San Diego, um, but San Diego is kind of weird where they have different parts of the city that's or different parts of the area that are considered San Diego, but there there's other cities in between one part of San Diego and another part of it. So uh, the closest part of San Diego, I'm probably about five minutes away, South San Diego, which uh, is adjacent to San Ysidro and the, the, the which is where the Mexican border is, the California Mexican border. And, uh, but north of where I am, I'm about 20 minutes south of downtown San Diego. Okay. And how is, uh, how is real estate there right now? We're December 7th today. What, what's the real estate story in that market right now? Oh, man, it's crazy because, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a, still a seller's market as it's been the past several months. Um, the inventory is really low. So you, you have a ton of buyers who are looking to buy home, whether it be their first home or whether it just be to move up from a condo, you know, with this pandemic, everyone's stuck inside, you know, a lot of times and they want more space. So a lot of people are trying to move back to the suburbs or move to the suburbs for the first time and have, you know, a little bit of 
more privacy in their own personal space, you know, as you would have with a single family home, a backyard or whatever the case may be. So I, I think that's true. That those those two things coupled with the the low interest rates are just making the market really crazy, driving prices up, uh, making a ton of buyers out there actively looking and, and it's just crazy right now. Yeah, it's, I think it's, when I'm speaking to people nationwide, it seems to be the same story. Like you said, it's that suburbanization, right? People are moving away from downtown. Beforehand, people seem to be flocking to downtown. Everyone wanted to live somewhere where they work. They didn't have to have a car. They could just yeah. walk to work or a bike ride. But now it's going the other way because it's like you said, you don't. If you if you're gonna if we're gonna go on another lockdown, you don't want to be stuck in a 900 square foot apartment, right? You want to be in a 2,000 or a bigger square foot house with a, ba a backyard and somewhere that yeah. you can go walk around and stuff like that. So yeah, it seems to be nationwide right now. And like you said, interest rates are just insanely low. Just when you think they can't go any lower, they get lower, right? And it just gives people so much bargaining power, which along with the demand, it gives people um, more buying, sorry, not bargaining power, giving people more buying power, right? Before someone yeah. who bought a $300,000 home, well, with these lower interest rates, they can order or buy a three fifty dollars or $400,000 home even. It's just it's just crazy. It's the same here in Las Vegas. My wife is a, a realtor here as well, and she's just saying that prices, if, if home's priced right, it goes off the market that day almost. Oh, yeah, it's like that. And 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 just to, to your point, the, the because of the demand, it's just the price appreciation is moving at a rate that, it's almost, I don't think I've ever seen it. <laughs> yeah. It makes you wonder how long, how much longer it can go on, right? At some point, there has to be a, a tipping point where people can afford, like prices just can't go to the sky, right? Because at some point you need wages to match that. And I don't think wages are going up at the rate that home prices are right now. It's, it's, no, it's definitely, not yet. yeah, not yet. If, if only, right? I wish I wish were. wages have been kind of the uh snail in the race if you will <laughs> yeah unfortunately yeah um yeah what is, what is what's the uh, average median home price there out of interest here in vegas now i think it's hit is it 340 or 350 and pre-pandemic it was 310 it just shows you how much the run-up speed i don't know what is the do you know what the average median home price there is there now where are you at? uh well it, it varies from neighborhood to neighborhood but if we're talking uh, county specific it's right around the mid to high fives okay yeah, and I want to say during pre-pandemic it was out five thirty-four. Okay. So yeah, right now I'm going to say it's probably five eighty five five <laughs> seven five. <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. Who'd have thought it? Right when the pandemic hit, that prices was going to go up. Everyone would have thought. Common sense would think that it would go the other way, but it just shows you that you know, you can never predict anything, right? The danger of trying to predict stuff is just you know it's almost impossible to do, especially with something like that. There's so many moving parts with it. Um, I, I, are, you, are you? Do you work with investors at all? You find are investors still investing in that market, or is it just? Oh, they yes, they are. They, really? Yes, they are, and that's um, been for the most part probably one of my predominantly uh, areas of focus right now is finding properties for investors, um, and 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 they're out there. I mean, they're vacant properties or distressed properties. They're out there. Is just you just have to do the. Uh, you just have to do the lead work and the hunting to find them. I mean, it's literally finding the proverbial uh, needle in a haystack. So uh, it, it's it can be tough, but if if you just stay consistent, uh, you'll you'll find them here and there. The, uh, and how, are these on the MLS? So how are you how are you finding them? How are you hunting down these deals for your investors? Uh, uh, you know, I have found some on the MLS. Um, those are available. Um, however, when, when you find those, I found it, you have a lot of other eyes and ears looking on the MLS. So yeah. there's a lot of level, there's a high level of competition or competing offers when you find those that are on the MLS. When you find them that are off market and they're not on the MLS, that's when it's pretty much, you know, it's, there's less competition and it's just you creating your own list and finding a way to contact that uh, that homeowner and, and inquiring if they are in the market to sell. And, and, and then after that, you're just trying to make sure the numbers make sense and then make a, put a deal together and then, you know, move on from there. Yeah. So are you, are you, um, 
do you just present these offers to investors or are you analyzing them for them as well? So are you running the numbers on them as well? I, I run the numbers first and then um, if they make sense, I, you know, I kind of have a, ten, I know what the investors like to look at. I know their numbers, what, what they like as far as return on their investment. Uh, so I do that myself at first and then I pitch it to them. And then if they say they're interested, you know, then we move forward. And, and prior to them saying they're yes or no, they generally run the numbers themselves, you know. So yeah, kind of like they trust me, but they want to verify, <laughs> right. verify that everything makes sense themselves first. Yeah, well, I think that's an interesting topic in itself. So when you look at a property, what in terms of analyzing the deal, what, what do you look like? How do, how do you analyze a deal? I think that would be interesting for some people to hear. Uh, well, when I'm, when I'm looking for them, I, I'm literally driving around in my, in my car and I'm looking for any signs of uh, deferred maintenance or any signs that the property might be vacant. Um, and I use uh, some, some apps that help me and, and I can pull the app right up and it'll tell me if that property is in distress, i.e. foreclosure, pre-foreclosure or vacant. And I can, I'll, I'll click a button on that app. It'll add it to my list, go home. I'll skip trace it to get the contact info for the homeowner and then I'll call them or, you know, some, if, if it wasn't, the pandemic going on, I'd probably knock on the door in some some of those cases. But and then after that, um, if I make contact with the homeowner and they are interested, um, I essentially run the numbers and make sure that I, I identify what an ideal price for an investor would be in order to sell it for for top value after the rehab on on in today's market. Mm. So are you working mainly with? flippers or buy and holds or a little bit of both uh uh mostly flippers okay uh, every now and then they'll buy and hold but um it's they're mostly just flipping yeah is that because the market doesn't support um rentals as much because i know for example here in vegas it's harder to find rentals that are cash flow but you can buy something and flip it, you know, because there's room to make that margin, you know, on it, but it's harder to find rentals because the price appreciation has gone up so much compared to what rents are, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's some of it, but I, I do have some that do like buying and holding. Um, the numbers again, just have to make sense for them. And it's just, you know, I would say two out of every three that I may work with prefer to just fix and flip. Mm. You know, I, I'm myself, uh, I, I intend on fixing and flipping with the intention of, of buying and holding and, and for long term, you know, cash flow. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I think I understand uh, why, but for people that don't, maybe explain to them why you're looking to flip first before going into buying and holding. Some people will say, well, why don't you go straight into buying and holding or why don't you just do flipping? What, uh, what, what is your thought process behind that? Uh, well, well, they all have some pros and cons, but for, for me, my thought process is I want to understand the fix and flip process and, and how to acquire a property that has some that is has some serious issues or some deferred maintenance. And then I, I my goal is to learn how to fix that from the, you know, and, and renovate it from the ground up or, or, or get it market ready, whether that be for a tenant or, or listing it on the open market. And one, I figure once I identify how to do that, then that's the perfect way for me to transition to finding properties to fix them up, to put them in, uh, put them on the, mar on the rental market as opposed to putting them on the for sale market. And, you know, once I have enough capital and I purchase that property, you know, it allow me to rent it out and then have some cash flow. And then once I build enough equity into that property and cash, I can, you know, either buy up or refinance and purchase another, use that property as leverage to purchase another uh, home to buy and hold or fix and flip. You know, there's, it just gives me another tool in my toolbox to, to, to leverage 
you know, my ability. So, yeah, that's a great point. Cause once you learn how to learn how to fix and flip, essentially you're learning how to fix a home, right? How to make it nice. Take a, take a home that's messed up and that has issues and fix that home up and make it into something nice and make a profit for it. But once you've learned that skill, you can then apply that to buying and holding. Cause if you can find a house that's distressed and that needs work and that has, as you said, deferred maintenance and issues with it, well, you're going to get a better deal as opposed to a house that's finished or has everything done to it, right? That's completely turnkey. You're going to pay market yeah. value for that. But if you can find something that needs work, you're creating value for yourself and you find better deals. So that's such a great point that, that you know, outside of the money that you make and whatever, it's the skill that you're learning, right? You're learning that skill. And once you're able to learn that skill, you can apply it to, to, to whatever aspect you want. That's such a good point. And I think a lot of people are, as well as this might be your, your case, it might not be is a lot of people also start with flipping to um, create more equity, to create more money so that they can then use that money, right? Because not all, not everyone is sitting on a pile of cash to invest in a ton of rental properties to start off with, right? So sometimes a lot of people, they start in flip, fix and flips because you can kind of make quicker money and have that velocity of money and grow your equity to the point where you can then buy rentals and have that passive cash flow. Because it seems like most people's goals is, and maybe yours as well, is to get that passive income to some extent, right? Coming in every month from some rentals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you hit the hammer, you hit the hammer on the nail. Exactly. Um, those are all of the above is exactly what I'm trying to do is, is, you know, create value in a home and, and provide some affordable housing for those that need it. And as well as, you know, help my, you know, help future generations that come after me within my family to pass those properties on to them. So it, it's, it's, yeah, it's all of that and a little more. Yeah. Well, that's what real estate provides, right? It's just such a cool investment in my book. And anyway, you can kind of, does so many things for you and for your life. It can be really, you know, investing right in real estate can really change your life. Um, with um, maybe be, before we kind of go on to some other stuff, maybe as we talk about the agency side of stuff, would you give anyone advice how to work with agents to start off with as an investor? Because I'm sure you see it, right? You have good clients, bad clients, right? What What are some tips that people can can do to help themselves and help the agent um, when they first start working or when they're trying to find an agent? Um, I think the most important thing is, is when, once you meet an agent, you know, just kind of get a feel for him or her, who they are, and allow them to do the same with you. And then after you've built that rapport with him or her, um, I would suggest you, um, you both set your expectations. I'll set my expectations with the investor. They set their expectations with me. And that way we're on the same page. We see eye to eye. We, we are, we're familiar with one another and what we're expecting and there's no room left open for misinterpretation for one of us to uh, point the finger at the other and blame and when when things go awry because I mean that's that's let's be honest things are going to go awry and you just gotta you know have have the you know inclination to want to make things go right but you they're things are not never always under your control. So if you have a good relationship with someone and you, they know your expectations, you know theirs, it'll, you just brush it aside and then you'll keep moving forward and you'll still have that relationship to, that'll benefit the two of you moving forward, so. Yeah, that's that's a great piece of advice. I think it's that transparency, right, of understanding. Because if you don't, if you don't, like you said, set those expectations up front. I don't know what to expect from you. You don't know what to expect from me. We don't know what. Maybe you don't even know what necessarily is a good deal or what how right. you would react in a situation or whatever. And if you set those expectations and have those transparency and have those conversations and have things set up so you understand how the other person works and what they want, that makes everything yeah. so much smoother. It doesn't leave any room for. Um, interpretation then right i can't just be like oh he he wants to do this or he wants to do that no i understand what you want and it just makes everything so much smoother so i think not only working for an agent that's i think you can apply that to any aspect of real estate so i think that's a great piece of advice that people can kind of take away from that and learn from that um so if you don't mind me asking you mentioned it earlier the two properties that were out of state can you do you, do you mind explaining a little bit what happened there if you don't if, if it's hopefully it's not too painful for you to share that story Oh no, sure, it's sure, sure. I, I have no problem doing that. So what happened was I had a, a had an old friend um, who had moved out of state, and they were they were finding properties in a sense um, while the real estate market was booming, 
and their the type of properties they were finding were for rental use, you know, buy and hold. So because this was a childhood friend that I had known since I was probably about 11 or 12 years old, uh, you know, I kind of trusted him. And uh, I took his word as being gold. So uh, they pitched the properties to me, you know, a handful. I said I was interested in some. There were some that I was not interested. The price just didn't make any sense in that area of the country. It was just too high. And they just decided to move forward with, without me and, and, and make the purchase. And eventually when those homes became mine, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't handle it well and they didn't have tenants in place in order to cover the rents. The, the, the mortgage was outpacing the, or the mortgage was worth more or the mortgage was higher than what the rents would demand. So they, they just really didn't have a good handle on real estate as a whole and how to identify those type of properties for, for buying and holding and renting um, because the numbers didn't make sense. If they had known that, the numbers would have made sense. Then it, they would have been properties that I, even though they had bought them without my consent, I, I probably could have kept them and probably would still have those homes today. Um, so in... That's 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 pretty much it in a nutshell. I mean, um, it just just went sour really quickly. <laughs> how were they how were they able to move forward without your consent? Then? How were they able to purchase the, these in your name without you 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 allowing for that? How did that work? Well, they had friends who were in the the industry, so they had someone that worked every position, as well as um, you know forging my signature. Oh. So they had someone who was an agent, they had lenders, they had appraisers, they had anyone you name it. So they were all kind of working in cahoots with one another so to make quick profits. And I quickly found out after the fact that what they were doing is they would purchase properties and, or they would identify properties to purchase and then they would have an appraiser elevate the value way more than what it should be and then they'd have somebody purchase it and they they'd essentially pocket you know thousands of dollars so that's that's what they were doing and it just kind of caught up to them so oh well so it was straight up fraud they were it wasn't like yeah, a, it was it was fraud. Landing or they were they was straight up fraudsters yes oh my goodness oh god yeah. I'm sorry, man. That was so. I'm sure there wasn't really much that you could have done there, right? You could have couldn't have foreseen this at all, especially if you knew if it was a childhood friend. There wasn't much that you could have going back that you could have done much differently. No, it wasn't much much I could have done because I was, you know, um, ownership at the time, traveling, and then even when I got back here to San Diego, uh, I'm still physically three thousand miles apart, so. And then I just began to receive uh, notice of default letters or mortgage uh, statements in the mail. And I'm like, I don't own this property. <laughs> and I called my friend up and I, I, wouldn't get a, I wouldn't get an answer. And then, you know, finally after a week or two, he'd finally uh, answer up and admit to it. So he, from there, it just kind of, the relationship just kind of spiraled downward. And, uh, and then that was the end of that. Were, were you able to take them to court or anything? How, were you able to dispute this, or, or did did you just? Yeah, I, okay. I was able to. I I, um, I filed a police report, and then uh, they were arrested, and uh, the mortgage companies uh, they eventually uh, removed me from being liable for those properties. Well, good. Okay, so it does have somewhat of a happy ending then. So it does, it didn't affect. You didn't have a, a bunch, a couple of foreclosures on your record or anything like that. No, no, no. Did, did that affect your um, your outlook on real estate going forward in terms of wanting to invest or anything like that, or, or not really? Um, for the time being, it did. But you know, as I mentioned earlier, it just made me want to get my license and understand the entire process or as much as I could about the the uh, that world because it was completely foreign to me. You know, I'm I'm trusting a friend because he, he, 
with uh, my good name and money and 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 uh, I have this is an area or an industry that I have no knowledge of or no familiarity with. So it was just a complete shocker. But, yeah. uh, I'm so I'm sorry you went through that, man. That sucks that you had to go through that, but I'm glad that you know, it was able to get sorted out eventually, right? I'm sure it wasn't fun at the time, but thankfully that, yeah, it, it was all cleared up. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad to hear that eventually led to, it, it, in some ways it was a plus, right? Because it led you to being in real estate, right? Maybe if you hadn't had that experience and I'm sorry that you did, but it might not have led you to, um, to be in real estate, right? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know how these things happen, how like something bad can, can end up in something good sometimes. There's always yeah, positive. It opened up a door that, you know, it's opening up other doors. So, yeah, very cool. Very cool. Um, so as this show is called Wrestling with Real Estate, I always like to ask wrestling related real estate questions. Sure. Uh, um, uh, and the first one I always ask is, what would your wrestling name be? If you picked a wrestling name for yourself, what would it be? Uh, I'm just going to go with Mike. Make a move, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> when we popped up today uh, on the uh, Zoom call, that's the name that popped up before, even before I saw, saw Mike. I saw Make a Move, Mike. So I was like, all right, I think he, I, don't, I don't think you'll have trouble with the first question <laughs> in this. So cool. Uh, so every wrestler has a special move, right? When they hit that special move, the match is over, right? It's their biggest strength. What is your special move in real estate, you think? Uh, I would say analyzing and, and hunting for deals um yeah i would say that would be my special move that's a that's a if you can find deals right you can you can make a lot of stuff happen i think that's a that's a great skill to have and able to not only find the deals but able to analyze it and know if it's a good deal or not so i think that's a great skill to have that's definitely a good superpower um, what's been the biggest body slam you've taken in your real estate investing career uh i would say it was those those uh properties that were purchased <laughs> fraudulently so uh, that would be it yeah 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 i would say that's a pretty big body slam as well i would i can't even imagine what it must be like to get notice of default for a house that you have no idea that you own right that's pretty uh <laughs> that's pretty random um so was there a moment that you were standing on the top rope getting ready to jump but you were too scared what was it and how did you overcome it uh once i got into once i got licensed i really didn't know how to go out and find business and then here I am in sales training when first time having a sales job and my broker's telling me that I have to go to either knock on doors or make phone calls to my sphere of influence or, or friends and family that I know or, or strangers. And that, that was like, wow, that, I had no idea that's how people generated business. And so that was the probably the biggest for me, jumping off the top rope, doing that. Um, how, how did you overcome that then? I, I uh, just essentially just doing it and then doing it and doing it and just doing it over and over and over again. And then your, com your comfort level increases. So the fear never really goes away sometimes, especially when you're knocking on a stranger's door that never goes away. But, you know, after the first three or four doors, it's like you're, it's like uh, you're, you've caught a wave, you know, and you just keep going and keep going and keep going. And, so yeah it's it's yeah sometimes there isn't an easy answer to stuff right it's just you've just got to do it right you've just got to grin grin and go just take that punch right just go through it go through that brick wall stuff and then like you said once you've done that first one right and you've got to see a second and a third whatever it is if it's just making phone calls if it's door knocking whatever it is right even deals right the first deal is seems scary to people but once you've done one two three four deals it becomes a lot less scary and you just have to go out there and do it as simple as that sounds a lot of times that's just the answer you've just got to face your fears and get that get in that discomfort yes exactly cool very cool well well make a move mike thank you so much man for taking the time today i'm, I'm happy we were able to to make this happen um before we go though can you tell people where you know if they if they're looking to purchase a property um, what's the name of your town again i'm so sorry i keep forgetting i'm in chula vista or so just san diego area san diego county okay. um, i work all around here Okay. Uh, sometimes I uh, venture out into Riverside County in the Temecula and Marietta area, which is about 60 miles uh, northeast of where I am. So I, I'm, I'm all over there, too. So if anyone's looking for a great agent who works with investors, um, I'm, I'm sure you work with um, first time home buyers and, and residential buyers as well. But how can they get a hold of you? Uh, they can just uh, find me on Instagram at Make a Move Mike. Uh, 
our, our Facebook at make, uh, facebook.com slash make a move San Diego. Um, on Twitter is make a move Mike as well. Uh, and my website is make a move Mike.com. So. <laughs> I'm seeing a common theme there. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Good branding. Good branding, man. Okay. I'll put the links in those descriptions down below so people can reach out to you. Hey man, this has been a fun talk. Thank you so much for making the time. I appreciate it. Have an awesome rest of your day. Oh, thank you, Barry. You too.